And this afternoon on the Cuddly Giant, a music special for you. Bluegrass views on bluegrass. Uh, bluegrass music currently enjoying a great deal of fame across the nation, but what is fame? Well, it depends on whom you ask. And since it's their music to begin with, we thought we'd pay a visit to the mountain country in eastern Kentucky to find out what exactly fame means in the mountains. Meet Barbara Edwards, Ashland, Kentucky, local musician and preserver of historic mountain music folklore. What's fame mean in the mountains? Mountain people use the word famous as someone who was famous as a singer in their own area, like up a certain holler, all the people, the families in that holler. But she was talking about a certain singer, this would have been in Greenup County, up Kellen Holler, and that he would be plowing on the mountainside or, or hunting in the woods, and he sang uh, old ballads, but especially the old Baptist songs, and his voice rang out through the whole holler, I mean, th all, through all the hills. And... Uh, and it was just magnificent. And they, you know, they, it's still a memory she holds after all those years. And and she herself, I finally got to sing ballads for me. But she used a, one of the lovely old mountain phrases, and I think it, it's a biblical phrase. She said she would try to sing for me, but she said, but I've kindly hung my harp on the willow. Okay. Here's Barb again, this time with a dulcimer. Recorded outdoors in Carter Cave Park yesterday. One morning, one morning, one morning in May, I met a fair couple making their way. One was a lady so neat and so fair, the other a soldier and a brave volunteer. Music on Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass. Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass. And this afternoon we're talking with Barb Edwards, preserver of historic mountain music folklore and local Ashland musician. Barb, how do mountain people enjoy bluegrass music? Uh, the ballads especially were woven into the daily cycle of life. Uh, a woman would sing while she washes her dishes or while she's down gathering the eggs or while she's rocking her babies. I don't know how many people that I've taped their ballads and they'll say, I remember Mommy rocking the twins and singing this, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, or the men might uh, be hoeing their corn and just, you know, blaring out a good old ballad. Uh, the instrumental music was uh, appropriate on the front porch of an evening when you came in tired and hot. and um, Or they had... Uh, 
Well, even before you had square dances where a whole community was involved, they had what they called play parties, which were really uh, square dances, except that uh, if you were religious, you didn't square dance, but you could do the same set and call it a play party. And uh, everybody would gather in, and this was appropriate on a Sunday afternoon, so even religious people could go to church and come home and have play parties. And you might, and, and you might have a fiddler or you might have a banjo picker. The guitar was uh, actually a later instrument. The earliest bands were, well, even, even the dulcimer was used before, well, I don't know if before, but if you didn't have a fiddle, a dulcimer could, could do in a small room. Bluegrass views on bluegrass. Uh, Kedley Jade. Next up, we'll have a discussion on the dulcimer. <laughs> Bluegrass views on bluegrass, a music special this afternoon on the Jim Ferguson Sunday Show. And we're talking with Barbara Edwards. What's the story behind the dulcimer? Where did it come from? The dulcimer is intrinsic to the southern Appalachian area, and, and I've uh, interviewed a number of people from right around in Olive Hill, Greenup County, and so forth that'll say, you know, why, yes, I remember that instrument. That's the only music we had when I was a boy, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I still meet people that remember them, usually old people. Most of the people who play them now, it's a product of a folk music revival. Uh, but early in this century and all through the last century, they were played a lot. Cecil Sharp mentions a dulcimer in his uh, introduction to his ballad collection, and he heard of it when he was over here taking down ballads, and uh, he said he heard that over in eastern Kentucky that they played an instrument called the dulcimer, but he never did get over to hear it. <laughs> so. Next, a discussion on, uh, well, the difference between music today and yesterday. Views on Bluegrass, a music special this afternoon on the Sunday Show. Here's Barb Edwards, Ashland, Kentucky preserver of historic bluegrass music folklore, and her thoughts on music today versus yesterday. Well, you have your music in little cans now. You can put on the record player or turn on the radio, and the music's done for you. But back then, I mean, it really was a do-it-yourself thing. If you had any music, you did it. And, and that's one reason that you find uh, music is coming down into tradition in certain families. Now, I could, say, go out here in Lewis County or uh, Elliott County, and I would find families where the man plays the fiddler, the woman sings ballads, they learned it from their mother or father and on back. Then you'll find a family that there never was any music in their family. <laughs> And so, you know, it really is a handed down thing and, and you you either made your own or did without. Next we talk about uh, bluegrass music being the daily newspaper. Love. Love now bluegrass views on bluegrass featuring an interview this afternoon with Barbara Edwards, a local Ashland musician. And we were talking about bluegrass music actually being the uh, daily newspaper. Well, I, I don't know if it was always before we had newspapers out on the streets, but in many rural communities, you know, everybody didn't receive a morning paper. And if an event happened, like a murder, uh, uh, some, somebody was very apt to write a ballad on it. Uh, the old-timers never use the word ballad for what they sing. They're not going to say, I'm going to sing you a ballad, unless they've got the words and they've copied them out by hand. Then you've got the ballad of it, is what they say. <laughs> and somebody might compose this ballad. Well, what do they call it? Uh, they call it a ballad. Oh, oh. Okay, I, yeah. it, once it's written down. Oh, well, they'll say, they'll just call it an old song, or of the real old ballads, they'll, they'll just call them old love songs or something. But it's only, it's only uh, uh, educated people that'll refer to all of it as ballads. Ballad. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we had a tradition, too. Court days was very important in many of the uh, county, you know, uh, towns. And uh, this is when you have, okay, the murderer comes in for his trial, you know. Well, somebody like in this area, Blind, uh, Jim Day, Blind Bill Day, who was the, known as Jilson Setters, uh, is kind of a stage name that Gene Thomas gave him, but he was a blind fiddler and very good. And uh, from what, just from what I've heard, he made his appearance at every court days. 
in 20 counties. And uh, he was at uh, Moorhead, uh, down at, way down the southeast at Catlettsburg. My dad remembers seeing him. A lot of people do. And uh, he ev he composed many uh, ballots, the famous one of the Round County Troubles, which was a murder on an election day in Moorhead, some t trouble at Moorhead, some of them call it. Uh, he composed that, and he might sell them for a dime a piece, and he was an old blind man. He had to get uh, all the money he could just from, he would hawk ballots or play his fiddle. Maybe uh, some of the old fiddlers played with a tin cup, and some of them, like this blind Ed Haley in Ashland, this was a little before my time, but he played on a street corner. His wife backed him with kind of a mandolin type instrument and with his tin cup, and I've heard tapes now. The man was a musical genius by any standards. It was, I, I've never heard a living fiddler right now that could be his equal. Wow. And people just walked right by or maybe dropped a dime in his cup, you know. <laughs> so these were the, like the daily newsletter, except it was sung. Uh, yes. To get to to uh, to get the information across. Uh, Very often, yes, and uh, the uh, every detail of what happened was usually written into the ballot, and sometimes that makes them kind of long and maybe a little boring because it tells you the date and who killed who. And if you get into a ballot that's written where there was a feud, and you have all these complicated alliances, you know, <laughs> and by the time they've written a verse on each one, it's really something. <laughs> I wonder, how long did it take them from the time that this thing happened, uh, wherever it was in the court or what, till they had it singing it on the street? Was it quick? Very quick, yes. Uh huh. Some, I mean, sometimes, m maybe within a week, people would start hearing a ballad. We're talking with uh, Barb Edwards about the, the singing newsletter, the original bluegrass music. And here's an example of uh, how that might be uh, presented on your doorstep. It was upon one rainy night, the second day of May. Stelly Kenny was murdered, for whom she was on her way. From her uncle Robert Frazier's, where she had been to stay. And spent ten months with him before her fatal day. She's taken to the city hall and on a cot she lay. Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass. Original singing letter there for newspaper. Perhaps Western Union didn't really have anything with the... Uh, Singing telegram? One never knows. <laughs> Next up, we'll be talking to Barb about what she likes to do. That's uh, collect old folklore music that uh, almost is on the endangered species list. It's 128, folks. Views on bluegrass. That's David Holbrook and his wife and friends in a jam session uh, up in uh, Carter County yesterday morning, uh, early this morning it was. And, uh, our next uh, topic of discussion will be folk appreciation. Everyone needs a place to be happy. We've got a happy place. 
Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass. And this afternoon we've uh, been talking with uh, Barbara Edwards up around the uh, Carter County area and uh, Ashland, uh, Kentucky. And uh, we asked Barb what she thought about uh, folk appreciation and uh, all the aspects of it. What I would like to do, uh, for some of the material anyway, is to see um, uh, good records come out of these people where they profit from it no kind of ripoff involved um, so that people can hear firsthand folk music by real folk <laughs> you know because uh, we usually hear it filtered through and then some urban personality comes out with old material and i just think it would be interesting for you know now there are record companies putting out what true field recordings now rounder records and tradition and county records and so forth uh, and there's a small uh, concern associated with Apple Shop at Whitesburg. They're a filmmaking group, but they on the sure yeah sure I've been there. Yeah, they do you know mountain type subjects. Well, they they're doing some records now in a small way, but we'll be building and maybe I will be able to work with them. afternoon we're having a music special on bluegrass talking with barbara edwards of uh, ashland and talking about the difference between uh, life in the mountains and life in the big city and particularly the ties that bind yeah it would be scary if you uh, lived by yourself in a huge city and you had to have the knowledge that if you went out and jumped off a bridge that unless they happened to come on your body nobody'd ever miss you you know <laughs> Of course, there are advantages too. You let, let's face it. If you live back in a in a hall or somewhere, uh, you, you're behind the times. I mean, uh, people in Appalachian might be uh, in Appalachia, are often living in the 19th century, even though we're in the 20th. So you maybe miss the forward thrust of civilization. You know, I mean, it's not all positives. But it, it all depends on whether the depends. forward thrust of civilization is positive. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. You might be uh, a century to the good yeah. on any one given day. But, you day. know, if you want to see uh, plays and hear symphony orchestras and uh, give your kid violin lessons and uh, go to art galleries or uh, uh, this type of thing, you're not going to find that in, 
Elliott County, Kentucky. You know, you might find a fine fiddler who has a lot to say about life and a lot of good music to play, but there's a lot of things you wouldn't find. So, uh, you know, it's not for everybody, but I'm sure there is something for everybody to be learned from it. Maybe it's just from, uh, there's such a similarity to the way the, the people are living that it's so much like the forebears of, the, of everybody in this country. You know, it's just like the, the pioneer thing before we had the big industrial booms and all of a sudden we were urban and technological. Uh, so I think everybody can get a sense of from, uh, where they came from, you know, whether they were born in Appalachia or not. <laughs> Bluegrass views on bluegrass, and uh, the next conversation is going to be about what makes mountain people different from any other people in the world. We're checking out bluegrass views on bluegrass this afternoon on the Jim Ferguson Show, talking with Barb Edwards, a preserver of historic mountain music folklore local Ashland musician discussing mountain people and our impressions of same and mine in particular. I got the distinct impression that there was little undecisiveness in mountain people. That uh, if they were your friend, uh, you couldn't want, you know, a better friend. Yeah. And if they were your if enemy, it, you couldn't have a worse enemy. That is true. <laughs> that is absolutely true. You know, speaking of that area where you were, uh, when I went to UK, and it's been a number of years ago, uh, a girl that I met there and became my roommate in the dorm was from a little place called Pathfork, Kentucky. And it's somewhere between... Harlan and uh, Hazard, probably halfway between, and it was a it was one of the little coal communities. Uh, people still live there, but the mines are gone, and you still see the ruins of the company store and that sort of thing. But you talk about a spunky little gal. She had uh, gone to the one room school and lived in a two room house with a big family. Had come to UK with only her one one dress and forty cents in her pocket, you know. But. Uh, there were a few girls who were from rather well-to-do backgrounds and proud of it. And everybody was getting to know each other in the dorm, you know, which means showing off. And, uh, you know, somebody say, well, I'm so-and-so from such-and-such, and my daddy is some such-and-such big executive at such-and-such, and my aunt has a French telephone and all that stuff. <laughs> and little old Pat just sat there. And after a while, she said, well, I'm from Pathport, Kentucky. It's a suburb of Black Star. My daddy used to commute to the mines. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bread, Diff 241 on the Jim Ferguson Show this afternoon. Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass, a special uh, featuring Barb Edwards, uh, Ashland, Kentucky preserver of historic bluegrass music folklore. And uh, she talks about her parents, and in particular, her mother. My mother now uh, came from a mountain background, but she lives in Ashland, you know, right in town. But still has retained an empathy with growing things and with animals. And ever so often there'll be a squirrel in her front yard that... Uh, will become her friend and it comes up to eat out of her hand at a certain time every day. Oh, in fact, we had one like that once. And if I forgot to throw out some peanuts, it'd come, it'd come up to our window where I used to sit in the rocking chair to rock my babies and it'd come up and look in and just wait to be fed, you know. <laughs> But uh, and then my, you know my mother has a, a yard where she can uh, grow you know a, a few things but not big for a big garden. But she has just a, a real green thumb mm -hmm. and it's from her background. I've I've seen her where where you'll get a vine and plant it and have to stake it with something. Mm -hmm. I've seen the stake start to grow. <laughs> <laughs> it's two forty two. 
They say for every boy and girl they're just one This afternoon, a feature on Bluegrass, Bluegrass Views on Bluegrass with uh, Barbara Edwards and... Uh, it's been very interesting. Barb is uh, into many things, uh, mainly in preserving that uh, tremendous uh, bluegrass music in uh, Kentucky and uh, also uh, into other things. We asked Barb a question as we prepared to leave. And, uh, are there any reclaimed uh, strip-mined mountains that you've seen? Oh, that's how they get airports down the mountains, didn't you know that? Now, that's the truth. They have little... Well, the thing is, we've got a, a, a whole lot of millionaires. We've had a coal boom. And, I mean, you'll see little signs that say airport, and it's spelled wrong, but it, by golly, they own a plane, and it might be right on top of this mountain that they've leveled off. And I have seen in uh, strip miners' propaganda where they say that we make more level land. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember reading in the paper this article that I thought they got to be kidding, but it wasn't on the editorial page. It was straight news where they were having this big to-do down in uh, Muhlenberg County. And this was before Paradise came out in that song in Drakesboro. And they had this big, uh, the uh, Paradise coal people and the city people were having this big argument that the uh, city owed them some money for electricity or something, and the mayor accused the, their coal company of trying to mine the coal right out from under the main street, and they said, now, nah, we never said we were going to mine under your main street, and if we did do some stripping in there, why, well, we'd build a shopping center. <laughs> when I was a child, my family would travel down to western Kentucky, where my parents were born. There's a backwards old town that's often remembered so many times that my memory...